We needed a way to seamlessly move from commercial bank electronic money into digital currency. All right, Jeremy, thank you. Uh, hey. Thank you for uh, coming on the show, my friend. It's, a, it's been a crazy day in the market, so I appreciate you making time. Absolutely, Jason. This is awesome. Very, very, very happy to be here. This episode is brought to you by Luca Tax and Exodus. Stay tuned for more info. Uh, so we're going to, I mean, we're going to talk about all things circle, all things stable coins, talk about your seed invest business, uh, kind of make this a little masterclass in stable coins. We'll talk about your early days in the internet. But first, I'm going to ask you a really important topic, which is about your headphones, because I was debating oh, yeah. With our, I was debating with our head of production. You've got the new AirPod Maxes on right now, and I was debating with our head of production uh, earlier today whether or not it's uh, it's an okay look to wear AirPod Maxes during during a recording. So it seems like you've uh, you've said that it's okay to wear them. Well, I, I was I'm like trying it out here. I don't do a lot of that, but you know what I've found is that it actually leads to really good quality, and so I'm I'm basically you know br- br- bringing that to bear. And hopefully it's a good look. Yeah, I know. I remember when the the, uh, the AirPod Pros came out, or the AirPods, actually, the first one, and everyone would give people shit when they were wearing them on the street. And now they're like, uh, I don't know, you, you got to have them, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in New York right now, and I'm, I'm looking forward to walking down the street with these, and it should be good. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a power look. That's a good look. All right, so let's... um. I mean, uh, what's on my mind right now, so we're recording this Wednesday, May 19th. We're going to release this tomorrow, May 20th, so it'll be pretty topical. What's going on in the markets right now, Jeremy? I know you're, I know you're more focused on long-term, 10-year, 20-year vision, but like, what, what are you seeing? Why did Bitcoin just tank to 32K and pop back up to 41K? What, what's happening? Well, I mean, there's sort of like the the actual like market mechanics of like you had a lot of people who were leveraged long. And when you have a price move that is going pretty hard against that, that can blow out that leverage that then creates a massive amount of liquidation, which then forces more selling, which just forces more liquidations. And so you basically end up with these really dramatic moves. And one of the things about the crypto markets that's different um, in, in some cases to to other markets is the you know the futures platforms uh, account for the extraordinary amount of volume the vast majority of the actual trading volume is in futures and it's in leveraged futures so people can go out and and put on like a a 10x a 20x a 50x 100x leverage on a long position uh and then if that if that goes the wrong way it's like that's a lot of losses so um and and so you you just have these magnified price moves um, to the upside as well as to the downside. And so you know that, that that's sort of the mechanics of why some of these moves get so dramatic in any given short period like that. But it also suggests you know when you see like these moves down and then moves back up, that li- that all those forced liquidations basically just get blown out. And then there are obviously a lot of people who are are quite long on 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 not just Bitcoin but a lot of other digital assets. And they're they're like this is really attractive, so let's start buying right now. And so you get these sharp sharp moves. But I think overall, right, you obviously had a, a, a pretty pronounced amount of growth. You had a lot of major new investors coming into this asset class over the last year, but in a pretty concentrated way over the first four or five months of this year. You obviously had a lot of brand name action around it, and so you just you saw a lot there. Um, and I think when you have a lot of new capital that comes in and it, the price moves so dramatically, um, it, it's trading like a risk asset, meaning it's trading like a tech stock. Well, a lot of people say, well, actually, people are buying this because it's a hedge on inflation or people are taking these really long positions, which many, many people are. But there's also a lot of people who are buying it because it's going up just like a tech stock. And so when interest rate expectations change and guidance that's coming out of say like the treasury or or inflation numbers or other things those things tend to create sell-offs in risk assets that's hitting tech stocks that's hitting other people who've just allocated more like a risk asset so then it can trigger some of these other changes and so take taking you know uh, taking a breather here is probably not not a bad thing for this market i sort of understand what happens on these short-term things but you know i've been you know you know in and around the space for about nine years um this is you know, not not uh, not at all uh, outside the normal. Um, 20% moves are, if you look over time and chart those, you can see there's a lot of them. 
um, uh, fortunately, generally up, up, up. Um, but obviously, there's there's points of uh, correction uh, that make sense too. Yeah. Well, welcome to crypto, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah. So when when you talk about the lever, the folks who are all levered up, are these primarily? Do you think the new the new retail folks, uh, or is it the institutions who are coming in the space, or a little bit of both? Yeah. I mean. The, a, a lot of the um, a lot of the like levered long is is um, is retail, um, but it's also you know let's just call it like high net worth, right? A lot of a lot of high net worth um, folks. There's a huge amount of high net worth um, out of Asia, for example. Um, high net worth individuals, uh, you know, out of Asia that would probably fall on that. And then there's obviously been a, a, a pretty significant proliferation of prop shops, hedge funds, other folks that are active in this who, who are taking those kinds of positions as well. I don't think your, you know, your mass mutual that's buying Bitcoin is out there trading like that. Um, you know, it, it, it's going to tend to be, you know, people who are either extraordinarily long uh, uh, and um, and that's generally not like the big institutions aren't doing that kind of uh, leverage uh, trading. Yeah. So, so I mean, this is kind of getting away from circle and stable coins a little bit, and we'll we'll tie this all together. But one one last question, because you, I mean, you've been building infrastructure for years. So I went to to you know quote unquote buy the dip today, and you know I won't name different platforms, but pretty much every single platform was down, um, and I was kind of jumping from platform to platform on mobile and desktop, and I couldn't really you know when it was down at like thirty two, thirty three, thirty four, like. I think everyone else had the same mindset. Uh, they, were, they were doing something. They were either selling or buying. So these things got overloaded. But what's actually happening behind the scenes? Like, why do the you know the the big platforms of the world go down? Like, what, what's what's the tech behind this? What's making this happen? Yeah, yeah. So I, I know because uh, I saw the tweet from Sam Bankman-Fried. FTX.us was up. Uh, they have a pretty reliable platform. They happen to be a commercial partner of ours, so I can give them a, a, a little plug. Um, but um, but but pretty solid platform. I mean, look, these are these are um, these are classic scalability issues, right? Um, you know, a a uh, an exchange, um, you know, the spot spot market exchanges, which is basically just you know people trading directly with each other. It's not like leverage or margin or other things. It's just like straight up buying and selling. Those are these these order books and matching engines. And those order books and matching engines are built on databases. They're built on, you know, um, tr transaction, uh, you know, application servers. And um, like like anything else, you hit scalability issues when there's more usage than you'd expect. Um, if you think about the growth in the number of people who are active in this space over the last period of time, it's probably, I don't know what it's grown by 5x, 10x or some huge amount. And that sort of gradually came in from a usage perspective. And then when you have something like this, you just you get you get hit with, um, a, you know, issues that might come up where your 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 database infrastructure just can't support it. And you get long queries or things like that, that just uh, is t typical scaling challenges. It's not like it's, it's sort of fail whale, uh, but, um, uh, you know, like Twitter went through. But it, 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 it kind of sucks when it's uh, money at stake as opposed to tweets. Yeah. I mean, why, why can't the guys like, uh, like, why can't you predict, why can't you just overbuild the infrastructure and the servers and the databases and just build 10x more than you thought it was going to be so that you never go down? I know, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, fan of Sam, by the way, and like my episode with, with Sam from like a month ago is, is by far the most ep watched episode we've ever done. And obviously, like, he's just, everyone's got a ton of respect for him these days, but there's some other companies that that they do constantly go down. So like, why don't they just ten yeah. x their build? Yeah, I mean, you never like this is like me, the technologist, speculating a little bit. Like sometimes you have like a core system that maybe was built uh, a while ago, and it's just it's not something you can like easily switch and replace, or it's not just like throwing elastic compute at it or whatever. It's it's actually requires some fundamental system design or redesign, and those projects tend to be long running projects, and you know sometimes. You get you get caught before you've been able to address those things. Hmm. Interesting. All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit. So one thing I'm really curious about is um, there are a lot of there are a lot of Sam Bankman Freeds in the space, right? And Brian Armstrongs, and you know who they. This is maybe their first 
big thing, right? Maybe you're Brian, you worked at Airbnb for a bit, or you're Sam, you worked at, I think it was Jane Street. But yeah. you, you, you've had a pretty storied career, uh, actually going back to the early internet days. And uh, there's a funny, funny story I'll share with you and I'll share with the audience. My co-founder, Mike, uh, his dad was, you know, kind of more old school. I mean, his, his dad worked, you know, in finance and worked in like corporate M&A for a little bit. And I remember we were trying to convince him that this crypto thing is real. This was a few years ago. And, and he just couldn't get it. Like we would, we would send him like, a, I don't know, like Laura Shin podcasts, which everyone used to listen to and just different yeah. articles and Reddit threads and tweets. And it just wasn't hitting home. And one day Mike gets a call from his dad and his dad goes, Mike, did you realize that Jeremy Allaire is building a crypto company? And that was kind of the, the pivotal moment. So we, we have you to thank for, uh, for getting Mike's dad into this one. So, so can you tell us like, well, what were your early internet days? What were you working on 20 years ago? Yeah. So yeah, I appreciate it. Um, and um, I mean, look, I, I got started working with the internet in like 1990 and um, before the web existed. And I, uh, I kind of, you know, I talk about going down different rabbit holes. Um, I very much went down the internet rabbit hole back in, in 1990. And um, what what captured my imagination back then was, and it was, obviously it was pretty raw. It was like, you could like move around like FTP servers and mailing lists and, uh, and other things, but um, was essentially, I was fascinated by the fact that this was a, um, an open network I mean, it was open in the sense that universities were attached to it and government agencies and stuff. But like, but it was essentially like an open network that anyone who could connect a computer to it can then peer to any other computer on it. And it, it was sort of built in this global way in, this, in, in what was essentially a decentralized architecture. TCPIP, the foundation of the Internet, was designed, um, you know, basically as a way to route data around and be resilient from say like a nuclear attack and it could route around the da damage from a nuclear attack. It was like true decentralization. So I got really excited about that and what that meant for how the world would communicate and how information would get distributed. And I got really obsessed with that. And then, you know, when the first um, web browser, well, the first web browser came out, it was the CERN web browser in 1992. It was awful. It was Tim Berners-Lee had built it for physics department. You know, you know, Tim's great but the browser was awful. Um, and, um, and then in, in the fall of 1993, the first graphical web browser like that worked on a graphical, you know, OS and had built like a couple of little tweaks to HTML. Um, really, you know, it was, it was, it was a huge, huge moment. And I had been working on the internet for a few years, but at that point, basically, you know, immediately became convinced like, wow, software is going to get distributed through web browsers like interactive services and content is all going to be distributed through this medium no one had access to the internet at that point it was still early days i mean it was you know it was, there was sort of pre-commercialization of like mass market access to the internet but it was really clear to me like this was a lightweight open way that you could put data and content out and anyone with a computer that had one of these browsers would be able to then interact with that so I got really, really excited about the implications and then helped, um, you know, uh, co-found Alera Corporation with my brother and college friends. And we created um, basically the first commercial, what's called web application server. So we created a, a product called Cold Fusion um, in, in like 1995. And basically it was a, a, a programming language that allowed people who could learn HTML to write interactive software that could be deployed in a browser. And it was the first like commercial product. It was a server product. So you'd buy this thing, you'd put it on a server, and then you could create an interactive app that ran through a browser. And it was really empowering for people. We were very focused on developers. How could we widen the number of people who could create software in the world by you know, in, in kind of empowering them with declarative, what we call a declarative programming model. And um, that was really successful. We ended up building like, um, many, many different web development tools. We had the most popular HTML editor ever back then um, called HomeSite. Um, we built out like web content management platforms. We built, you know, a lot of different like infrastructure as well, like fundamental infrastructure for how software could run on the internet. Um, and then, um, you know, that was in, in during, you know, 1994 to like, you know, 2001. Um, 
and you know built a public company, millions of developers and customers using it. And you can still find a lot of sites that run on this still today. Um, so that may be where where, where uh, your your co-founder's dad had been familiar with 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 th those developer products. I, I can't go anywhere without people being like, I I learned to program with this, or I built my first website with this. And so yeah, we we were very involved there and um, did a bunch of stuff after that. But but that was sort of the early days, um, you know, that I was involved in. Nice. Uh, I, I think it's, I don't know, I always find it funny talking to entrepreneurs who built things back in kind of the, you know, 1990s, early 2000s. And I, because I know how tough it, I, well, I don't know personally how tough it was, but I've just heard so many stories about how tough it was and, you know, what the early days were like. And then you talk to folks who built really successful companies and you're trying to make them summarize, you know, six, seven, ten years of work in like three sentences of being like, I had an impact. Yeah. I built a successful company. Let me try to explain it to you in three sentences. So yeah, no, it, it is encapsulating a lot um, <laughs> into that, um, and um, but but uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we'll talk about the connection to crypto and stuff too. But um, I think you know the, the there are these threads that run through everything. And um, but yeah, I mean that 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 was an incredible, insane time. I was you know, just graduated college, had no idea what I was doing. You know, all of us were like, this is the first time we're ever doing anything and had admired people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Mitch Kapoor, who, who you know, were these early PC revolutionaries. And we were like this, you know, we're going to be part of this new revolution of the internet. Um, it was, uh, it was really exciting. Um, and uh, a lot of hard work, an, an enormous amount of hard work. Yeah. Do you remember uh, any days while building Alaire Corporation and what you were building back then, do you remember any days when you thought you might not make it? Totally, absolutely. I mean, the the early days are really hard. We're we're really hard. You know, before we had, you know, we didn't even know what venture capital was. Like we didn't, you know, we, we were bootstrapped, and um, and you know, it, you know, er, early days there were a couple of people brought in who were like the business guys that like knew what they were supposed, to, you know, knew how to like do this and and then it like turned out one of them was like trying to get their like brother to do like they essentially like a, a like a hostile takeover of the startup and like we were missing payroll we had to get you know one of the you know early founders like fathers had to like bail us out with like a hundred grand and like it was like yeah we were basically basically right about to die um i mean that's happened many times in lots of different phases like you have you have you know, crazy stuff that happens and you have tons of failures tons of products you build that just don't work i mean I've, I've worked on dozens of products over the years and you know a lot of them are have had great success and a lot of them haven't um and so that's just part of it you just have to keep you know keep keep iterating trying and and yeah you need you need just a lot of really 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 you know, persistence um in the face of extraordinarily you know tough situations you just can't do it without facing that have you had that uh with circle i mean were there any times in the in the early days where you were just like man i'm i'm not sure if, if we're gonna make it here i mean there i think multiple phases and, and this is like common to any startup i guess but like certainly i can use circle as an example it's like you know that we were a, a, a little bit um you know, we, we were blessed at the start because we had access to a good amount of capital because I had built multiple successful companies. And so investors knew me and were like, here's a bunch of money um, and and we could get it started. Um, but, you know, in, in 2013, like when we were, you know, working on, on Circle, like, like people didn't want to meet with us because they thought like we might be criminals. I mean, like pe people like we couldn't get we couldn't get an insurance company to give us insurance. We, you know, people talk about banking, getting banks, you know, we were one of the only companies to actually get a, a, a commercial banking relationship. Um, and I can tell you how hard that was, but like, we couldn't get an auditor. Like we, like so many people are just like, I don't know if I should be talking to you. Um, I mean, it was like really, really hard. And, you know, but we like, we knew, we knew exactly what we were doing. We knew exactly what we wanted to build. We could see the future. Like we could really clearly see the future. But it was really, really hard. Um, and, you know, you, you had to constantly, you know, you're just facing just like 
basically endless skepticism. Every person you talk to, everyone you, you know, in the media, wherever, it's just like all, all, all it is is just massive, massive skepticism. It's hard to build something in the face of that. I mean, for anyone, you second guess yourself. Um, and then, you know, you have the existential thing of you create this thing, are people going to use it? Do people like it? Is it, you know, is it going to work? Um, and those are always existential moments. Um, and you no, know, so you have some of that. So that was sort of the early days, you know, definitely a lot of those kinds of, of challenges. Um, and then, you know, we obviously have kind of ridden different phases of the market in different ways. Do you have someone that you call who, whether it's like a, a founder coach or your best friend or, a, or an investor when, I mean, those, uh, th those crisis days when you're, when you're uh, not sleeping too well? Well, I, t I talked to my brother a lot and, and my, my brother is, um, he, he created the original cold fusion programming you know, system at Allaire. He was an extra, he's an extraordinary entrepreneur. He's built many great companies himself. We were together working on that. And then, um, and then he's gone on and done, done a lot of other stuff. And, and so we talk, we talk a lot and we talk about all kinds of things that are challenging. You know, the, the most difficult things I can always talk with him um, and think through. There are lots of other people as well, like people who've been mentors, um, people who've helped me grow um, in, uh, in in different projects that I've worked on. You know, s some of my earliest friendships became entrepreneurial relationships as well. And so those people are, are always great for those kinds of conversations. All right, guys, it's ad time. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. There's one company that's powering a ton of the crypto data in the space. And by crypto data, basically there's all these uh, companies, traditional financial institutions that need crypto data for you know accounting purposes, for tracking the value of their assets, for running audits, right? And so there's one company, they're called Luca. L-U-K-K-A, I've talked about them on the podcast before. They're powering some of the largest businesses in the world in both the crypto and traditional financial services space. They're the primary pricing source used by S&P Dow Jones indices for their new crypto index. So I want to uh, just throw this out there. If you guys are any sort of business that needs to value crypto assets, create financial statements, uh, perform any sort of normal accounting audit process, you guys should head on over. It's Luka, L-U-K-K-A, Luka.tech, L-U-K-K-A dot T-E-C-H forward slash empire, or just head over to Luka.tech forward slash empire. Tell them I sent you, they'll take care of you. Alrighty, let me know what you think. The other day I posted on Twitter, I said, who's the best entrepreneur? Who's the entrepreneur that everyone should know in crypto, but maybe doesn't know already, right? We're not talking like the mainstream, the super big folks. Who's the best entrepreneur that's kind of under the radar in crypto? God, post went crazy. Got like 300, 400 comments. There was one name that kept popping up, JP Richardson. JP Richardson at Exodus. So I thought, man, that's crazy. Exodus is one of our sponsors. Let me call him out, right? So JP Richardson, CEO of Exodus, done an amazing job building one of crypto's most loved apps. And there's a number of reasons. They got a mobile app, they got a desktop app. You can instantly exchange over a hundred different currencies. They've got interactive charts. Uh, they're fully integrated with uh, the Trezor hardware wallet, so you can always be secure. So if you're looking to buy crypto, if you're looking to just get away from just buying one or two currencies, you want to explore other things, go to exodus.com forward slash empire or just search Exodus in the uh, App Store or Play Store. Check them out. Shoot me a DM on Twitter. Let me know what you thought. Go follow JP Richardson. Go check out Exodus. All right, exodus.com forward slash empire. I was reading the uh, the Series A, the Circle Series A deck that you put up on Rarible, and yeah. um, I know it was, a I, I it was just a couple Circle a couple of slides. Said, yeah, it was like two slides or something. But I but I uh, I noticed that it said Bitcoin Internet Bitcoin Internet Financial Services Company. It wasn't Circle. Was that the name of the was Biffs the name of the company back then? <laughs> yeah. So the, the naming's a good story. I'll 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 talk about this. So. Typically, like when I've started a company, like my my um, my last company, Brightcove, when I incorporated it, 
I didn't call it Bright Cup. I didn't know what the name was going to be. And so when you incorporate a company, it's like, I don't actually know what I'm going to brand this thing. Um, I know what the big ideas are and I know it's going to have a, it needs to have a great brand, but I, I got to like incorporate. So I just like say, okay, what, what am I going to use? I'm going to use something that's super plain vanilla descriptive that actually doesn't really say much of anything. And we had, we had actually in that first draft of the deck, we were, we were going to incorporate as yes, Bitcoin internet financial services. And, um, um, we actually changed it. So we were actually originally incorporated as Boston internet financial services. And I wanted it to not be even, I didn't, I didn't want it to say anything about crypto because I didn't want to scare people like if it had Bitcoin in the name and also like our vision for what we were building wasn't just tied to Bitcoin. It was, it was about this idea that you're creating a new kind of internet based financial services company where actually the entirety of the tech was the internet, like a financial system entirely built from the ground up on the internet. So this idea of internet financial services. And I just said, we're in Boston. We'll just call it that. And then that was like, not a name we use. We never traded in that name other than like signing agreements and stuff. And then later, before we were introducing like the company and the products, then we ended up um, getting getting you know, Circle Internet Financial Services is actually the name now. It's Circle Internet Financial Services Limited. And it you know, we bought Circle.com. How much did you spend on Circle.com? Almost 5% of my Series A. <laughs> Nicely done. That's awesome. Um, all right. So when, so when I was, when I got into the space, uh, circle used to be the main place that I bought Bitcoin and Ethereum and these, you know, other things. Uh, and then all of a sudden, like that wasn't circle, wasn't the place circle was more of a B2B business. And, you know, so we'll talk about two different things in, in the future of this podcast. We'll talk about circle and then we'll talk about the USDC and stable coins, but kind of as a, as a pivot point here, can you tell us, what the early circle was and then like why was i buying crypto through circle and then you sold it off to voyager like what happened there yeah no um i'll give you the uh i'll give you a bit of the journey it's been amazing um so the the when we founded the company the vision that we really got anchored on was that you know money should work the way the rest of the internet works and that we should be able to store and transmit and exchange value with the same ease that we can do that with content and data and other things on the internet. And, you know, the, you know, back in late 2012, early 2013, sort of Bitcoin was sort of like a kernel of that idea. It, it was an expression of, of how that could work. Um, but when we were looking at, um, at the technology back then, what got us really excited was um, this idea that you could actually issue other kinds of assets on top of these public networks. So you could issue something, another type of token beyond the native token of the blockchain. And, you know, technologists back then were writing about how you could do things like smart contracts, how you could actually execute code that could run on these networks as well. And again, given my original background and thinking about like the infrastructure layer of the internet, that just made a huge amount of sense to me. Got, got my co-founder and I, Sean, and I really, really excited. And the conception that we had early on was we should be able to build kind of a hybrid model where you could take what you think of as traditional money, in other words, like the liability of a central bank, and express it as a digital currency that could run on these public blockchain networks over like a protocol. We used to talk about like there needs to be an HTTP for money. There needs to be a protocol anyone can connect to, um, anyone can build to, that provides that same kind of simple interoperability for money that we had for, for content, which is what HTTP had done. So that was like big conception one. And we, the first product we built, Circle Pay, was actually a really clear expression of that idea. So we actually took, took a long time to build this, but we basically built a digital currency banking infrastructure, custody, treasury, risk management, all the fiat infrastructure, got all the licenses that we needed to be able to do all this, which was really, really hard as an early crypto company. Um, we got the first bit license, you know, uh, did things like that. And we built a product that actually allowed you to take dollars sitting on a debit card or, 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 you know, pound sterling sitting in a bank account in the UK and actually spend it in real time over the Bitcoin network. And so you literally could go from a debit card to a Bitcoin address instantly. And it was like magic, right? And the idea was, you know, Bitcoin would be 
this interoperable settlement infrastructure. Everyone could connect to it. It wasn't controlled by any company or, or government. Anyone could connect to it. And we would create a way to take fiat and allow you to transact it over that network. That's actually what the way Circle Pay, our first product, worked. And as part of that, it actually turned out to be basically like the best way to get Bitcoin um, because we allowed you to use a debit card to get Bitcoin and send it to a Bitcoin address with no fees. And so that was actually quite good. So it was actually faster and cheaper than any, anything else out there. Um, now, that wasn't, we didn't design it to be a way to buy crypto. We, we, that was like a side effect of it. Um, we designed it as a way to kind of reinvent how money could move using public blockchains, using the Bitcoin network. In late 2016, basically we ran up against all the technical limitations that Bitcoin had. And, and you know, the Bitcoin community, I think, justifiably was saying, well, these aren't technical limitations. This is like B Bitcoin is not meant to be like a high volume payment system. Bitcoin's not meant to, you're not meant to like extend it and write code on it. It's like Bitcoin is Bitcoin. Just leave it alone and like that and, and improve some of its fundamental things. Um, but at that point, we basically said, well, that isn't going to work for our vision. And so we made a decision to kind of re redesign the way the whole system worked into what became USDC. And we built that on top of the Ethereum blockchain, which actually had taken, you know, it was you know, Vitalik, you know, created Ethereum out of a similar set of frustrations with not seeing advancements in the Bitcoin core architecture to be able to do things like issue assets and create programmability and things like that. Um, so, you know, that was sort of late 2016. And we said, okay, now we can actually build something that could actually function like we originally envisioned it. And, and I'll come back to USDC in, in a little bit, but to come back to your question, we had that product. We, um, uh, we, we began work on USDC, but in, in building that first consumer payment app, we had built a lot of great infrastructure for moving funds in and out of banks, moving funds into crypto. Um, we were running at the time, like one of the very largest OTC trading businesses in the world called Circle Trade it was trading billions and billions of dollars a month. It was a huge, huge business for us, all institutional. And um, we married our consumer product capability that we had created from our original payment app with, um, you know, with our, our trading infrastructure and created what you knew as Circle Invest, which is like a very streamlined, simple way to 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 get into crypto. And that, you know, that product kind of got launched like right into the heart of the market correction that then became the crypto winter. Um, so like we launched it in May of 2018. And if you go look at the charts, you can look at the charts and you'll see like May of 2018 was kind of the beginning of the that period, the beginning of the end of that period is really the start of the the, the crypto the crypto winter. That's uh, we launched Blockworks May of 2018. So I right. said we uh, I was joking. I mean, we, we timed the we, we timed the bear market. Timed it perfectly. Well. Yeah, yeah. No. So yeah. there are a lot of there are a lot of things there. So we had launched that, and um, but what you know, we had also bought uh, one of the biggest exchanges in the world, Poloniex. Um, so we had a trading business. We had this retail brokerage product. We had a trading business, and we had USDC, and and uh, we also acquired Seed Invest, which I'll talk about later. But USDC was sort of like the. I, I, I would view it as kind of like the crown jewels of the company and and really the essence of what we were focused on when we founded the company. And, you know, in 2019, as kind of like the market kind of bled out and, and frankly, as like giant companies like Binance emerged and just, you know, basically ignored all the regulations, sucked all the sucked a lot of, of, of market share out, um, you know, we basically made a decision like do we really do we really think that like we can make circle invest the the largest you know crypto brokerage app out there or should we really really focus on on what has really really strong product market fit which is usdc and could we build out a much broader set of capabilities around that and so it's it you know making those tough calls right so um we we actually sold the trading businesses basically generated a good amount of of, of capital from that um and put 100% of our, our effort behind, you know, really scaling out what we're doing with, with USDC, building out a broader set of platforms um, for people who want to build on top of that, people who want to build payment apps, commerce apps, financial apps, other things 
around it. And that, that has, you know, done extremely well for us. Um, and, um, so that was, you know, that was sort of what, what led us to that decision. And, um, it's really easy to sort of say, well, you know, if we just put a little bit more or we just keep this here or, you know, whatever that you can keep it going, but sometimes you just have to make, make those tough calls, make those hard decisions and move on. Yeah. I, I remember that acquisition of Polonius. I mean, I like, that was a crazy, it was like 400 million bucks or something. Um, and so I imagine just like spinning these kind of things out was, was a really tough decision. Very tough, extraordinarily complicated, extraordinarily yeah. complicated um, and, and really, really hard. So you're talking about like things that are hard, you know, buying and integrating a really, really complex exchange, really hard then spinning one out also really hard. Um, a lot of these things are, 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 are hard. So I've grown a lot as an entrepreneur. Um, I've, I've, uh, I, I feel like I've, I've learned a ton, um, you know, and, and, you know, I, one of the reasons that I got into this space is so I was like, this is really hard and complex and I'm at a point in my career where I want to work on hard and complex things. So I definitely have gotten a fair share of that. Yeah. Um, is, is Pol Poloniac still around by the way? Wasn't, didn't some like random yeah. Asian fund buy them? I think it was. Yeah, Planix absolutely runs internationally. And um, it, it actually, I, I haven't tracked it closely, but it, I think it, it actually does a pretty decent amount of volume, but I, I, I'm, I'm not involved with it at all anymore. Nice, nice. Um, all right, I have two, two quick questions that I'm just curious about, and then we're gonna get into more like nitty gritty of circles, business and stable coins. Um, one is, what if you don't mind sharing how come sean left the business i mean that's probably you know I, I can talk a little bit about it so sean has is still very very involved in circle so so sean is um he's a director of the company so and we meet like every week um so there, there's there's a lot that we uh are operating around um and um you know I, I can't comment on specific stuff that he's working on but he's working on some pretty incredible stuff right now that is also things that are, you know, related to things that Circle's working on too. Um, and um, yeah, so there's a, a lot of really strong collaboration there. And, and he's technically my boss now because he's on the board of directors. Um, and uh, and uh, we're, we're, uh, we're constantly working together and collaborating. Yeah. Nice. Uh, the other one was I was um, just kind of going back. I, Ryan Selkis posted something about Mount Gox yesterday. And I was going back to the old Mount Gox forums and reading about it. And and there were a few different articles and I guess the reporters loved you back then because they kept quoting you. Um, and so <laughs> I, I think it was like February 27th, 2014 or 2014. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Mount, Mount Gox and like, oh, they yeah. took like 7% of the circulating supply with them. And I think it was like 800,000 Bitcoins, uh, which obviously would be just worth an egregious amount today. Do you like, yeah. can you, for the listeners who are just, just coming into the space, can you remind folks what it was like? Uh, I know today's a bloodbath, but can you remind people what it was like on that day? Oh man, I mean, you know, I mean, there, 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 there are a lot of these like major, major days in, in crypto history. Um, I think, um, you know, when, when basically like Mt. Gox, you know, was was hacked, and people are like. Oh my God, I just lost everything. Now the value then was quite a bit higher. So a lot of the people who were in Mt. Gox had been really early in, in Bitcoin. Um, some of them had gotten in during the bull run of 2013 that cranked up to like a thousand dollars. But there are a lot of people. And, you know, as you probably know, even today, like most people, don't want to be their own bank and don't want to hold their own private keys and don't want to think about losing their seed phrase or any of that kind of stuff. And so people kept stuff on exchanges because it was like the safe place to keep it. It's like, I, I don't want to deal with this and there's liquidity there and everything else. So, I mean, that was a, a major, major thing. And there's actually a funny story, which is that, um, so w one of the things that Sean and I worked on that was a really core part of the value proposition in the first, you know, release of our first product was we we're like, we're going to basically create a way for people to be able to like hold, like deposit and hold Bitcoin um, and store value in it. And we want it to actually be insured. You know, there's no FDIC insurance for crypto. 
but we were like, we want it to be insured from theft, from hacks. And so we, we, we actually built a very sophisticated, um, you know, kind of cold storage system, security system. And we were actually working with essentially the, the global insurance market to try and create the very first digital asset theft insurance market in the world. And we actually did. We created one of the very, very first ones. But literally that day, the day that Mt. Gox was, was, was going on, I was sitting in a room with insurance underwriters in New York City and like explaining to them why what we were doing was going to be safe and and so on and literally like the fucking news was coming up that like the biggest exchange of the world had been hacked there have been all these massive losses and you know i was like oh shit like there's no way we're ever going to convince any insurance company ever to underwrite that risk because it was just like this 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 like in, insane thing that was that was happening we did end up getting the insurance um, we did end up having one of the first insurance products, and we still do. We 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 maintain a, a, a really really sophisticated digital asset theft insurance product on our custody. But I think that was a big moment. People were terrified. Obviously, market correction. But early days, like that was the exchange. Like there were there there were other exchanges. Kraken existed. Um, you know, but Mount Gox was like where all the liquidity was and everything else. Yeah, it was like Mount Gox and uh, and Bitstamp, right? It was another big one. Back Bitstamp was 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 there as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's get into uh, uh, the the reminiscing stuff is fun, but let's get into today and and even more exciting. Let's get into the future. So, I think um, I'd love to get into USDC and stable coins, um, and we can tie that into circled business as well. But I think just for me, like, it's it's been a really interesting. Uh, past 12 months because I had never really interacted with stable coins except uh, occasionally u using USDT and Tether, uh, but that was for more trading purposes. Uh, but now running, running Blockworks in this business, it's been really interesting because over the last 12 months I've gone from everything was based on wires and checks and you know just actually really in the last six months, everything's USDC. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's actually really frustrating and, and it kind of, it's, it's maddening when someone wants to send a wire instead of, instead of sending USDC. And we had, we actually had an advisory meeting. Uh, a lot of our advisors, except for Matt Hogan at Bitwise, a lot of our advisors, they don't work in the crypto industry, right? They're media folks yeah. and, um, and they don't really, yeah, they don't really work in crypto. And we were explaining to them that their companies should accept USDC because it's so much easier. Um, so can you just actually go super high level, 50,000 feet, like what is USDC? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll connect the dots a little bit to stuff that we talked about as well, which is that, you know, the, the, the conception that we had was that, you know, you, you, there should be like a protocol for money on the internet, right? And like I call it the HTTP of money. And the idea being that, you know, if you had a protocol for money that was similar to like protocol for content, then you could, you know, exchange value instantly at the speed of the internet um, with, you know, with anyone in the world that's connected with any piece of software that could support it. And, and you could do it super, super efficiently in the same way that we can do that with text or data or, or other kind of communications. And, like that was like the quintessential founding idea of Circle, and it it, w it was really it only became technically possible to do it once you had like second generation blockchains. So stable coins, to some degree, there were examples of stable coins that existed that were not built on these second generation or, or now third generation blockchains. Like Tether originally was built on what was called the Omni protocol, which was like an abstraction layer on top of Bitcoin that allowed you to create a, a separate asset. It was like one of those early examples. But the basic idea, um, you know, was just create this transmission mechanism for dollars that could work on the Internet that, again, the same way that content can work. USDC itself um, is it's is, is a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. It now exists also on the Solana blockchain, on the Stellar blockchain, on the Algorand blockchain. So it's not tied to one blockchain. And um, it's a stable coin, obviously, because its price is uh, always a dollar. Um, now, what makes USDC, um, I think, you know, 
always a dollar is that it's always redeemable for a dollar. And there's a whole framework that we built around it to give the market um, confidence in it. Um, and, and that's not just like, hey, I believe this thing is fully backed by a dollar. It's actually regulated that way. So we went out and we had built all of these licenses to operate kind of fiat and crypto infrastructure for our first like, you know, four years. And we said, OK, well, why don't we work with the regulators to introduce a new product that uses, you know, crypto networks, uses public blockchains um, to transact a dollar digital currency and it would be governed under or regulated under um, state banking laws. And so all the kind of consumer protection laws that exist, there's a whole lot of uh, a very, very deep amount of consumer protection law, any money or laundering law, financial crimes law, like all this sort of stuff. It would, be, it would have a regulated framework around it, which was really important because if we, we believe that something that ultimately could be widely accepted by everyday people and businesses would people need to feel comfortable that it was actually like a legitimate, you know, form of the financial system. Um, and under, under that regulatory framework, we're required to hold a hundred percent of those customer funds. You know, USDC is treated as what's called electronic stored value. So we have to have a hundred percent of those funds held on a one for one basis. Like we have to do that by law. Like if we don't do that, like I can get fined or even worse, if I did something really bad, could go to jail. So like there's, there's laws and regulations, and then, um, and then obviously there's the technology, which is you know, you know, create something that would work um, on an open network like the Ethereum network that then anyone could build to and connect to. And so one of the things that really has helped USDC grow so much is that it's it's a standard that anyone can connect to on a public network like Ethereum. Obviously, we brought um, along Coinbase as a key partner in it in, in getting the standard launched. Um, and we built a governance process around it so that people understood like the intellectual property on it is open source. Um, and there's like a real governance framework around it. And then, you know, kind of launched that. And, and I think that's, that's what's you know, made it attractive. And I think the other thing is Circle and Coinbase in particular, you know, we have great reliable infrastructure where you can create and redeem it and you can create and redeem it for free whether you're a business, an institution, or an individual. And so, you know, we've created a model that makes it very, very easy for people to, you know, to, to participate in it. And then what's happened is basically as more and more gets in circulation, exactly like you're describing, people are like, well, this is just better. I'm going to stay in USDC and I'd prefer to transact in USDC. And it's sort of like this, um, actually one of, one of my colleagues at Coinbase used to say, you know, this is like uploading your dollars to the internet. It's like, or ripping your your CDs into MP3s or whatever metaphor you want to use is like actually making this digital thing that is actually like a digital bearer asset that you can utilize on the internet is so powerful pe people don't want to go back um, and that's why the circulation just continues to grow. Yeah, I remember Fred Wilson. Um, I think it was like I think it was when New York it started said that Coinbase could actually list USDC. I remember he had this blog post. And he said, look, like he explained it. He said the back one to one. He said, I think like Grant Thornton was auditing it. He said, but more than any of that, the important thing is that USDC is programmable dollars. And he's, he had that yeah. analogy with the cassette tape, right? He said, kind of like the difference between an MP3 file and a song on a cassette tape. Like once an asset is natively digital and there's no strings attached to the physical world, it can be programmed and routed digital, uh, digitally. And, and, and then interesting things start to happen. Totally. I mean, that was like, going back to the founding of circle, like that was the, the, the two ideas that really got me so excited. One was we're going to be able to create a protocol layer for money, like dollars and pounds and euros, but that works like as a digital currency, the same way that Bitcoin works basically, but you know, that, that kind of thing. And that once you have that, once money is a native data type on the internet, the promise of programmability is so profound um, that, you know, back in, eight years ago when we were doing this, like smart contracts were like ideas on napkins, um, but like as someone who built programming languages and app infrastructure for a living for a long time, my, my mind, my head was exploding with like, oh my God, programmable money natively on the internet that's interoperable that people are going to be able to tr you know, safely interact with in a secure way with like decentralization. Like this is, 
this is it. This is going to completely rebuild the entire financial system. And it's like, I mean, I'm all in for like 20, 30 years. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. So, so let me ask you this, because I remember, I mean, the stable coin, I think the, the stable coin usage and the data, all the numbers are up and to the right. But the hype is a little lower than it used to be. Like if you remember like 2017 and 2018 and uh, like there was like a basis that algorithmic stable coin that was like a hundred million bucks from the guys from Princeton. And there's, there were all these stable yeah. coin projects launching. Um, can you explain kind of the difference between you have like Libra that, or I don't know what Facebook's even calling it these days, like DM or I, I forget the name, like it's not pegged to a specific fiat currency. They have all these different ones. There's stable coins that are asset backed, but not fiat, but not fiat backed. You had these like algorithmic stable coins, like basis. Like, why do you guys choose your model and, and are there any advantages of the other models? Yeah. So I think we're still in the early days of innovation in stable points. Um, so I, I, I definitely don't want to say like, hey, this model is the one model and that's what everyone's going to use forever and ever. I definitely don't believe that. Um, but we had to choose a place to start. And, you know, our, our view is that if the goal was to kind of create a protocol that allowed people to reliably, easily, inexpensively kind of transact dollars on the internet, um, you know, it was probably most likely that businesses and consumers and individuals would would want to rely on it if it actually was like truly like liquid for dollars and it was wired up to the existing financial system. So you could seamlessly move between what we think of as traditional electronic money and this new form of digital currency. and Secondly, so, so that was really important that it was actually wired up to the existing financial system because that that to me was like if the if this big growth phase was going to happen, we needed to upload our dollars to the internet. We needed a way to seamlessly move from commercial bank electronic money, what I call ACH money, into digital currency, and you needed a, 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 a essentially a, a model of digital currency that could facilitate that movement. Um, I, I think a second piece was. Um, you know, what, what gives people faith in the, in the, in the fact that one USDC is equal to $1 is that it is actually a full reserve model that is one for one backed by dollar based assets that are, that are you know, from a regulatory and legal perspective, they are there, um, and they're audited and, and, and everything else. And so just to get, get people to be like comfortable that, yeah, this actually is truly always redeemable for a dollar, as long as like you can meet like the compliance requirements of a company like Circle or Coinbase or other exchanges, et cetera, that are out there. Um, like that would give people faith, uh, and, but also like know that this is something they can rely upon. And so just for this phase of, of where we are in the market, that seamless interoperability with the existing financial system and, you know, you know, building something that, you know, the, the, the average person or business would go, okay, I get that. This is like a, uh, uh, an online, you know, version of what I, I think of as my traditional, you know, electronic money, uh, traditional bank money. Um, and it has all these like superpowers that come along with the internet and come along with, you know, digital currency and they like that, but that, that kind of underlying kind of security and trust models there. Now there's a lot of things that people would say, well, that's a real problem because, you're, you're, it's not decentralized. It's a hybrid, right? So USDC is like a hybrid model. And I think from some people's perspective, it would be really great to have a dollar token that, um, that was not, you know, that, you know, basically like a, a, a government couldn't censor in some way. Um, and, you know, we, we, and Coinbase have both made the choice that we're going to be operating within this compliance sphere and, and so on. But, but clearly, like, there are projects that want to create dollar pegs um, that are backed not by, uh, you know, not by actual dollars, but, but are backed by other forms of collateral, um, other forms of crypto collateral, and that create various forms of market incentives to keep the peg, basically. Um, and, you know, I, th I think those are really interesting, really, really interesting projects and, and worth paying close attention to. Um, and, um, and I think actually it's not a zero sum game. I think you're going to see growth in more and more experimentation with algorithmic type stable coins. You're going to see growth 
like huge growth in dollar based digital currencies like USDC. You're also going to see growth in other stable coins in other currencies. Um, today, stable coins are principally dollars because it's tied to the kind of global digital asset markets. Crypto economy is largely tied to dollars, but as this permeates everyday transactions in more parts of the world, like people in Europe are not just, you know, governments of Europe aren't just going to say, okay, everyone's just now using dollars, right? So there will be a euro coin. There will be a, you know, a, a pound sterling stable coin. There's going to be stable coins in other markets. Um, and that's part of the maturation of, of blockchain infrastructure into being a bigger part of the financial system. So, I mean, so let's talk about that because we, I mean, we, I, I mentioned kind of like the Libras of the world and there's the algorithmic stable coins and there's like DAI and there's USDC. And I mean, it, it's pretty cool to watch from an outside perspective because USDC is essentially kind of becoming the, you know, the, the it's US dollar coin, right? It's like the digital yeah. currency of the US. Yeah. But in other, in other places of the world, they don't have, you know, circles and coin bases and uh, these consortiums building this. So what they're obviously, you know, gonna create is these central bank digital currencies. And I've heard you come out pretty, pretty anti CBDCs. So can you kind of share your thoughts on, on the central bank digital currency? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of, a lot of pieces here. I mean, I, I think the first is just like, when we think about outcomes, what do we want in the world? What does society want? What will people and businesses really benefit from the most? And this is not, to, I'm not trying to be totally self-serving here. I, I'm, I'm a step outside the circle here for a minute. Um, be, because I think there are really important lessons that we should take from the way that the internet has evolved. And when we are stepping back and thinking about the future of the global financial system or the future of the international monetary system or the way that money works, I think it's really important to be grounded in if we, if we really are trying to build something that's, that's building on the internet itself, like as a fabric, um, we want to, we want to have that be developed on top of public networks, public standards, open source protocols, this whole bottle that has served us so, so well for so many decades in building up these layers and layers and layers of the way that internet can serve society and the economy, how can we apply that to money? And I don't believe that the way that we've seen the internet thrive in the world is that big government agencies in countries have gone and built a whole bunch of stuff and launched it to people and they've used it. That hasn't been the case. That just hasn't been the case. There are exceptions to that without a doubt. And there are countries that are far, far more vertically integrated, let's just say, that are able to have, you know, engineering led innovation by the government and government administration of things. But even talk about China here, just for a moment, everyone's all like China's running ahead, they're gonna they're gonna dominate the world with the digital yawn, etc. If you if you look closely at what's going on with the digital yawn project, it's being designed by the government of China basically to counter the private market power of uh, of Alipay and Tencent. Digital money is already ubiquitous in China. A billion plus use it, a billion plus people use it daily. They use it daily. And I think in, in China's case, it was felt that that was too much power in these two private companies. And it was actually disintermediating the state-owned banking system, all these state-owned banks that, that actually exist in China. And so they really needed to build something that could put more power back into the state-owned banks and into the government and remove some of that from these, these private companies. The, the reason I bring this up is that a lot of the discussion that comes out of Washington or frankly out of media pundits, think tanks, ivory tower, all these places that are like, we need to compete and do something to build something that's as good or better or whatever. We've got to catch up with China. We got to out China, China. That's what people are saying. We have to out China, China. We have to figure out a way. We have to race. It's an arms race. They're doing it. We're not. But that's completely effed, man. The reality is in the West, like we're really proud of the champion technology companies that we build. We're really proud of private sector innovation. That's like, that is what has driven so much of the, the Western global economic system. And so at this moment in time, are we really saying, no, let's actually 
let's actually have the government build it. Is that really like the, the answer? And when in fact, the, like this is Dante Desparte who joined us as chief strategy officer and head of global policy. He joined us from, from Diem um, where he was working on that prior. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, he sort of says as well as like, you want to you want to see who's winning the actual race for 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 fiat digital currency. The U.S. is already winning the race. Dollar digital currencies on open public blockchains are thriving and growing. And there's a robust global ecosystem that's building around them of thousands of private companies and and open intellectual property contributions and all this stuff is happening right now. That's actually winning. That's winning the race. So I think people have it wrong. And I think that they're thinking about it wrong. And I think that they think, you know, we just got to run off and do it. Now, there are that I don't want to diminish like very, very real substantial issues around monetary sovereignty, around monetary policy transmission, around reserve policies, um, you know, around, you know, ultimate, you know, consumer protections, other things like I don't I, I don't want to sort of assert and I don't think I can assert that what you know, center has developed with USDC is the final end state of the way that this stuff will operate. I actually think there's a tremendous opportunity to collaborate between the public sector and the private sector. I think there's probably new forms of charters and licenses and other things that will emerge around stablecoin issuance in the United States and other markets. But I don't think the answer is, you know, just go see a bunch of central bank digital currency projects. I think that we should look at what's happening with all the innovation that's happening in the public blockchain space and build on that. And that's actually how you compete. Mm. Um, you, you know that Chicago plan that said uh, we should move to the full reserve banking system uh, and, and not the fractional reserve and, and it didn't, didn't end up happening. I, I think my question for you is how do you make sure that what you're building right now doesn't just become a fractional reserve bank? built on top of crypto rails, or, or maybe that's your goal to do that. I, I don't know. But. No, no, totally. So, it, you know, I, I, I run a podcast to money movement and there's some, a couple of episodes on this and I actually had two of the, the, uh, t, uh, so, so one of the people who studied the Chicago plan most deeply, who's actually works at the bank of England right now and has published a lot on it, even in recent years also is I think thoughtful about digital currency topics um, and interviewed him. Because I, I believe in the Chicago, in the Chicago plan, and I believe in full reserve money. Bitcoin is full reserve money, um, and I believe that it's possible to have full reserve money and have high velocity of money, and to build um, various forms of capital markets based on that. And I think that that is actually a more sound, secure form of uh of the of the future of the financial system um and so i'm i'm really focused on that i think it's really a, a critical thing um and i think there is a tension that exists between fractional reserve banking and commercial bank electronic money or ach money which is this fractional reserve money and full reserve digital currency um and i think there these are going to be large macroeconomic and monetary policy questions that everyone in the world faces in the in the coming decade or two. And I think what we're seeing is that you can have a high velocity of money and you can have super, super efficient transmission of value and, and have it be on a full reserve basis. And I think it's worth revisiting some of those ideas. Um, and um, I'm not an economist. I'm definitely an armchair economist at best. Um, and but but I think there are design principles that we're following um, and have followed here that that um, I think are really important. And and actually, when you think about programmable money and, you know, this idea that you have a digital bearer instrument of a dollar or a euro or whatever it is, like it's really important that that thing is. Is a, a, full, a full reserve instrument um, for it to kind of work in that programmable infrastructure. If it's just programmable IOUs, that's a really different, uh, different problem space. Yeah, um, you you keep mentioning ACH money. I mean, do you think that like let's extend this out? Um, I don't know, ten years from now, do we move money using the HCA, ACH system still? Is there like a an ACH 
group of like, I don't know, if you're 50 and over, you use the HCA, ACH system. And if you're like 50 and younger, you use uh, like USDC or does everything transition to USDC? Like what, what is five, let's call it 10 years. What does 10 years look like? I've been working on some long-term models recently. And so I do actually have a point of view. <laughs> um, but um, I think, um, you know, M2 money today in the world, not just the US, is like $100 trillion of value. And and, and that's ACH money, basically, all around the world. Um, and, and, and ACH money is, is commercial money in the banking system? Commercial, is that yeah, co commercial bank electronic money that, um, you know, by definition is fractional reserve money, but basically commercial bank electronic money, that's M2, the M2 money supply, that's like $100 trillion today. And, you know, I think like, I think about the internet and transformations of existing industries that the internet has had. And, and you think about the time frames, 10 years, 20 years, these things, it actually does take a really long time for these things to, to change. Like even today, the vast, vast majority, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's probably greater than 80%, probably closer to 85% of viewing hours of video is still broadcast and satellite and cable. Like it's not YouTube and Netflix and other stuff. Like we might feel like, well, God, why would I ever like get a cable box? But like actually in the United States, it's it's still it's still a, 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 a migration until COVID hit. E-commerce, retail e-commerce, I think was like 15 percent of retail, like still the vast majority. Right. If you if you look, you know, if you look at these these sort of things, it does take a long time. So in 10 years, could could um, digital currency models like USDC around the world, I'm not just talking about just what we're doing, but around the world, could it could it represent 10% or 15% of that electronic money equivalent? Yeah, I think it could. So I think that would be in the, you know, in on today's dollar terms, 10 to $15 trillion. Clearly, that'll be a bigger number at that point in time, just based on inflation. Um, but um, I think, um, you know, our, our, our view is, is that these could certainly in the next five years grow to be a trillion dollars in circulation or something like that. And, you know, dollar money markets today are like five trillion dollars, just as an example. So if, if your total addressable market here is, you know, M2, 100 trillion, and, you know, let's say 10 years from now, you're able to take down 10 to 15 percent of that. You know, the, the circulating supply of USDC is 10 to 15 trillion. Where does that put Bitcoin? Well, it's an interesting question. My, my own view is that non-sovereign uh, commodity money in, in digital currency form like Bitcoin is going to grow pretty massively. Um, I mean, there's, there's sort of political and economic questions, but I think, I think it should continue to be a, a very, very large um, share of, of what happens. And um, so I, I, I think simultaneously, you'll see this digital currency transition for fiat. You're also going to see continued rapid growth in the sort of monetization of, 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 of these new digital commodity monies as well. I, I don't want to make a prediction on like how big this, this that, that kind of thing, but I think they'll continue to be very, very large. And they're quite, yeah. I think they're complementary uh, ultimately as well. Yeah, interesting. Um, to wrap it up on the stablecoin conversation, um, there's these like first order, first order effects of uh, of USDC, right? Which is like the you know the movement of money gets commoditized, and intermediaries who extract these large tolls end up getting hurt, and the cost of transacting end up getting pushed to zero. What are some of the kind of second and third order effects of this? Yeah, I think that. Um... There's a couple of things that, that I'm really excited about. I think one is, and this gets to the programmable money side of it very much, which is once you have, you know, money as a data type on the internet and it becomes programmable, then you can start to see functions of the financial services industry or functions of the financial system 
move on chain. And you know, that's what DeFi is today, right? It's a it's an early version of basic like primitives of the financial system that are expressed in code that exist on these public networks and they're they're capital market protocols. You're taking a capital market function like the allocation of capital from person A to person B or institution A to institution B and you're creating ways for that to happen governed by almost like autonomous machines on the internet. And that kind of migration of the underlying mechanics of financial services delivery to public blockchains is super, super exciting. And that to me is the next big thing beyond the commoditization of, of moving around value. I think it's, it's really reconstructing how the, the capital markets function of banking um, into this infrastructure. And, and, and that'll have profound implications for people and businesses around the world over time. And the other thing is, and I think we're barely, barely, barely scratching the surface of ideas here is financial arrangements more broadly. Um, people say financial contracts, and I think they oftentimes think of derivatives and options and things like that, but financial arrangements, like, I have an arrangement with my employer, which is my labor contract, or I have an arrangement with a company I'm buying something from, or I'm selling something to, or supplying something to, all these different economic arrangements that exist um, in the world can be rethought of. They, they can be reconceptualized with this programmable infrastructure. And so I, I'm sort of interested in the commerce layer of all of this. Um, as well as the finance layer, but the commerce layer, and what kind of business models and can can be can be transformed with that? Like sharing economy, to me, um, the on-demand economy, the sharing economy was like an early version of the deeper kinds of things that can happen with labor markets in a world of programmable money, in a world of you know uh, DAOs, and in a world of of corporate forms that exist on blockchains. I think that's where the really exciting things start to happen. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to think of the kind of second order impacts of the, the Visa news that happened back in, I think it was March, right? Where Visa, uh, for those who didn't see the news, Visa now settles payments, or I guess they either trialed this or tested it, but they settled the yeah. first payment, uh, their first ever, I think, stable coin payment. They used USDC. Uh, yep. and I think they had other partners like Anchorage and crypto.com, but yep. they settled payments in in stable coins uh, and, and specifically in USDC. And I was trying to think of, you know, I don't know too much about how Visa and MasterCard and things like that work today. But what I do know is that, you know, different types of companies such as banks make a lot of money on the float, right? And, you know, T plus two or, T, you know, sometimes T plus three, or maybe there's seven day settlement time if you're using mm -hmm. something like Swift. And so I was trying to think of who really benefits from instantaneous settlement, probably the people, um, and, and, and the person who's receiving it, but who gets hurt here? Uh, it's probably the banks, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I think, you know, at, at, at a high level, right, the business model of, of, of um, facilitating an electronic payment is, is a business model um, which in, involves, I think, trillions of dollars of value today in, in, the, in the world. Um, there's... It is a major, major source of revenue for banks. It's a major, major source of revenue for the entire payments processing industry. Um, and um, and there's a lot of complexity there. Um, and, and, and I think the promise of this is obviously that a person could transact with another person or transact with a business directly, the same way like I can open my browser and visit your company on the web like I'm just like there direct in a direct relationship with you, that that same kind of transactional relationship can happen. And that business could accept a digital payment with the same ease that they could receive an email. Like they don't, there's not like a, they don't pay anyone. Like they just put a mail server on the internet and boom, now I can receive email, put a digital currency wallet on the internet. Boom. I can receive a, a, a dollar payment and that that would cost them basically zero to do. Um, that's, that's, that's where I think we get to. I mean, I, I really do think that's, that's where we get to, and that will be really attractive for businesses. 
there's other things that people always counter. Well, you know, there's, um, you know, there's all the like fraud mitigation, which is like, what if you're buying something and someone's defrauding you? So there's like insurance and, you know, and then there's like, well, like there's all these incentive systems to use these certain payment methods. Like people are giving me cash back or other things, but like, loyalty systems, point systems, insurance systems, all that can move to blockchains. And so if there are, if there are ways to, to, that those become important things, like I have every faith in the world that you can do that with stable coins. Um, and, and I expect to see a lot of that happening um, in the near future. Um, but I think that the, you know, the ability to take a rev share, which is what like a credit card processing fee is like take a rev share on every dollar of value that comes in like a 3% rev share or 1% rev share. I don't think that's sustainable over the long run. Um, I just don't. Yeah. Yeah. You, I think you end up seeing those type of folks. I don't know how you guys do it, but kind of almost providing those types of services as a utility to people and making money out in in other ways. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of how USDC functions today. It's as a utility. yeah. 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 Um, Talking about Circle for for a second, and I know we're coming up on time here. The the last number I saw was like I think it was three hundred Circle accounts or clients or four hundred or I don't I, I don't know the real number. I know a lot of crypto companies. Uh, most yeah. I know I, I know a lot of crypto companies use you have a Circle yeah. account and they get, yeah we they have to ask, yeah thousands you know, thousands of companies yeah yeah oh that oh wow okay cool um anyways they get to access payments payouts, there's a marketplace kind of that they get to access, they get USDC yield services, they get this digital dollar account. It's a really phenomenal service. I, I mean, if there are any founders or you know CFOs listening, I'd recommend checking out just the Circle service. Um, but one thing I'm curious about is, I know all these crypto companies are using it. Do you have any like Fortune 500s or big institutional banks that are starting to open up Circle accounts and, and actually hold USDC on their balance sheets? Yeah. So, yes, um, there are banks, there are corporates, there are um, traditional payments companies. Um, there, there are a lot of different types of companies that are that are doing work with us. Um, and you know, we'll uh, you know, when when we can like announce stuff for people, we get PR rights. We'll obviously do that. But yeah, that there 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 is a really interesting evolution there. Um, we're seeing in particular like an incredibly diverse type of corporations and financial institutions that are looking at participating in things like USDC based yield markets, um, which is, you know, we have a product that's um, becoming available in that space. Um, And so you're definitely seeing really interesting um, diversification starting to happen. It's really exciting. All right, Jeremy, I think we could talk for honestly hours here, but we're coming up on time and I know you're on a a busy trip to New York. So I'm going to, uh, end it with a few, I think maybe three or four questions here that we can do semi rapid fire. Uh, and then you can actually finish this up and flip the interview and ask me one question if you have it. So uh, first question for you would be, where do you consume your content? Like where as in like what device or like what uh, destination? Podcast, podcast, media companies, Twitter, uh, any yeah. specific people that you like to follow or listen to their podcasts or read their newsletters. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a, a varied uh, amount of media. So, I mean, I, I have a healthy dose of crypto Twitter. Uh, I, I, I read, uh, I scan like a lot of different kind of crypto news uh, sites. Um, I, uh, and then I'm on podcasts. I don't, I'm not like a subscriber. I like listen to every episode of, of everything. I'm more episodic. So like if I, if I see an interview that I'm interested in, or oftentimes we'll, we'll search for that. Um, you know, so, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a, a lot, a lot of variation there. Um, and, um, I, uh, I barely have enough time to consume media, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. You have the, yeah. I, I, uh, it's getting tougher and tougher. I don't know. I've got this, uh, this Rockefeller book that's been on my desk. It's taking me like six months to get through 500 pages. Uh, yeah. I'm like trying to find yeah. time. Um, if you, do you have any action items for the audience? Like if, you know, we talked about USDC and we talked about Circle, like do you have any action items that someone could do in the next, 
I don't know, 72 hours if they want to start playing around with this kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think like it's there's a couple things. I mean, obviously, like if you haven't used USDC, like I would encourage you to if you're if you're a business, yes, you should like look at opening a circle account. If you're an individual, I mean, you can use Coinbase, you can use FTX, Blockfolio are some great um, apps and services in the US. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm personally uh, a, a huge a fan of what Sam's been doing with Blockfolio. One of the things that's really cool, which I'd point people to is um, like you, you can like you can get dollar deposits with like cards and bank transfers, but you can actually use USDC on multiple blockchains. Um, and and one of the things that we're really excited about is how do we make it so that you can transact USDC basically instantly or within like a second or less and with like, you know, pennies as a transaction fee instead of like super expensive gas fees and with like a lot of throughput. And they've um, they've launched um, uh, Solana USDC in all their infrastructure and um and you, you know i would highly encourage you to like play play with that like do peer-to-peer -peer payments using usdc using something like solana usdc it's pretty pretty amazing it actually rivals like you know a venmo um and so those are cool things to look at um and then you know obviously i assume you know with a lot of your listeners people are already familiar with DeFi and stuff but you know put some capital to work using usdc in in a DeFi protocol it's pretty magical um and so I would obviously give give people uh, uh, a push to, to do that if they haven't already. Um, we talked about a lot of tough decisions that you guys made, you know, both at your you know, 20 years ago, but also just at, at Circle. What's the toughest thing that you're trying to think through right now? <laughs> um, you know, I think the toughest thing in an environment like this where there's so much going on and you know there's just always more than you can do the the toughest thing is just figuring out what to do next um what are the you know i mean it sounds really basic but it's actually like making sure that you're you know applying your intellectual property creation in the right direction in the right way because right now there's so much going on it's very easy to get like super diffuse um and so it's just basically prioritization that's the hardest thing um, in, in, a, in, a, in a market that's expanding where you have so many different demands and other things that are going on. Um, it's, it's, um, it's like knowing where you're going to get the most kind of leverage and value out of what you're building in the next week, in the next month, in the next quarter. That's the hardest part, I think. Um, yeah. 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 All right. We can wrap it up. Um, Awesome. If you have one, one, one question for me, if you want to uh, flip the interview here. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think a question you probably ask a lot of people, but I'm always curious to hear is like, you know, what was your, what was your moment of, uh, of, of like, aha and, and deciding to kind of commit yourself to this, this, uh, this work. Yeah. I mean, probably, probably similar to you. I, there were multiple, uh, I, and probably similar to most people, there were multiple aha moments. I first heard about Bitcoin. I was living in Budapest, Hungary. So that was really interesting. Um, just, you know, the, the Hungarian students out there were really interested in this self-sovereign money because their parents lived under, uh, you know, the communist regime. And then, you know, 1950s Hungary was not a good place to be. Uh, and then came to the States, worked in venture for a bit, started falling down the rabbit hole. And then I ended up going, actually, was, I remember this really well. I went to this one Sunday event. It was like a 2 p.m. event. And I heard from Amanda Gutterman who was at uh, Consensus with a Y at the time, I think it was. I think she was their CMO. And then this other guy, Adam Helfgott at Madhive. And they, they explained Ethereum and my mind just kind of exploded. And I came home and I, I was looking with four other buddies at the time. And I said, I'm launching a, uh, a crypto company. Uh, <laughs> you guys should uh, hop on board. And, and uh, Mike, my current co-founder was one of my roommates. And, and he said, all right, I'll, uh, I'm in. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, down the rabbit hole still. Long way to go. Indeed. Indeed. All right, Jeremy. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for your time here. Thank you, Jason.